It's the last day of the off season, which means it's time for a no fun, wet blankety topic. What could actually go wrong for the Pacers this season? Everything is good vibes in Indiana, but could stuff get off the rails? Well, Tom Lewis will help us break it all down today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Friday. Congrats. You made it through another week and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today we're diving into a not fun thing that has to be talked about stuff that could go wrong for the Pacers this year. I've had like half-baked thoughts of doing this many times throughout the summer, but Tom Lewis of Indy Cornrows is joining us today to really dive into it because he asked an awesome question Tuesday to Chad Buchanan and Ted Wu at that press conference that really got me my gears turning on chemistry and health and the Pacers repeating their successes from last year and what it will take for the Pacers and what could cause them to not live up to the expectations set for them. A fitting topic for the last day of the offseason. Next Monday's media day. We can put all the offseason behind us. Officially, it'll be time for the games and for the action. So we'll get to that next week. But for the last episode of the summer, let's talk about could anything and what could those be go wrong for the Pacers this year with Tom Lewis. It's Mr. Indy Cornrows himself. It's Tom Lewis here because he asked my favorite question mm-hmm. Tuesday at the press conference with Chad Buchanan and Ted Wu about the upcoming season. I'll tell you what that question is in a second because a more important question, Tom, how are you? How excited or not excited are you? We're back and rolling with media day on Monday. I know all of a sudden it's here and uh, it seemed like the season just ended with that long playoff run and and then the Olympics, but Hey, it's uh, it should be fun to, uh, to see how this team can uh, move forward uh, without many changes at the top. I don't know if they had planned for this, but like they play into deep May and then they re-sign Siakam in mid-June and then the draft and then Wiseman and then a couple weeks later, Nemhard and then a couple weeks later, the Olympics. And it's like there was always something going on this summer. It never felt like we were really like away. So it feels so crazy how fast it went. Yeah, the, the dust never quite seemed to settle. Like, I thought it was done a couple of times, and then T.J. McConnell said, it's like, man, what are we, we going to do? I'm waiting for yeah. IJAX here before the uh, start of the camp. It was interesting because they were all things we thought could happen, but the deadlines made them all spread out like that. But that yeah. T.J. one, I was like, that could happen two months ago. Huh? So yeah. this was on purpose. They were just keeping us in. So I said this already. Tom asked my favorite question on Tuesday because – this was, I think what the Pacers did was smart, and they've talked about this very directly. Like they, One of their superpowers last year was depth and chemistry for that team, right? And it worked really well for them. It got them very far. And you can see on the court when a team likes each other what that actually looks like. And so that was valuable to them in free agency, clearly, as they kept all their players. And yet, every team does kind of end up taking on a new life every year, whether that's because of expectations changing, whether that's because of money changing, whether that's because of how long someone's contract is changing, whatever it could be. And Tom asked about getting the same chemistry back as last year, not being a given. And in my head immediately, I went back to thinking about the yay woohoo fun 2012-13 Pacers immediately followed by the yikes, same result, but not nearly as fun vibe 2013-14 Pacers. So Tom, I'll open the floor to you. What did you think of what they said about that? Do you feel like that actually should be something they should be concerned about? And what uh, what do you feel like that could manif- – could it could it look like it did a decade ago? Yeah, well, I think uh, Chad Buchanan answered it as I hoped he would. Like, you're right. This is a different team. You know, at the very beginning um, of his comments, he mentioned, we hope they can have the good chemistry they had last year. But, again – all the, all the variables, um, there were a lot of guys. I mean, let's just take Andrew Nimmer for, for one. He probably wasn't thinking he was playing for a contract, <laughs> but he was so so woefully underpaid by the by the results that he had that um, he ended up getting paid. And, and um, all these other guys that have gotten their extensions, um, will there be any exhale with those guys um, and, and their effort? Um, the reason they signed him, I think, is because they don't believe those guys were really <laughs> – running on just looking for that payday. Um, and I, I feel like the, the organization at least um, feel, understands that this is a different thing. And, and even, um, you know, Rick Carlisle um, 
can't remember the phrasing he used. Um, we talked with Kevin Bowen and, and Andy Swinney about um, not not being happy with where they were last year and having to having to move forward. I mean, I think that's going to be a big theme here once um, we start hearing from the guys after after camp that you know, hey, yeah, great, you made it to the Eastern Conference finals last year, but that's done. Now we're, now what? You know, so that's yeah. uh, that's a big thing. Rick's phrasing was intoxicated with success. They can't exactly. Get... I knew there was a good little line in there. <laughs> That's a Rickism now. I'll throw yes. that. One. I'll throw that one onto the list. It was pretty good though, and I think you've heard that a little bit. I don't know how much time you've watched of the videos Pascal put out from the team yeah. mini, mini camp, but that's like half of what they're saying in these huddles. It's like, yeah. hey, it's gonna be really hard to get back there. Like we've got to really work. But it just it just can every year take on a new life of its own. The theme of what we're talking about today, since I haven't actually said this with you yet, is stuff that could go wrong. And this this made me start thinking about that being something that isn't a given for this team. Here's what I would say, though, about this specific iteration of the Pacers compared to other teams in the past that, that this has happened to. And chemistry can erode anywhere, too. This is Pacers specific is, as you know, Tom, you've been around this team. Tyrese Halliburton has this just such a connective personality. I would even say that like Obi Toppin does, TJ McConnell does in a way that I suppose it's possible for chemistry elements to change, but I find it, I would find it harder to believe with this team than other teams that that makes sense because one, their leader and best player is one of the guys who has that personality, but they have a lot of guys who are, you know, they're just very likable by their teammates. James Johnson, even who they keep bringing back. Right. Like, I think, I think they're very cognizant of it and making steps to make sure they get that chemistry back, but their leaders and best players having that personality, I think makes that less likely, even though it's not impossible. Yeah. I, I tend to agree. I feel like, um, you know, I, this team respects Carlisle and he's yes. not, you know, he's not going to let up in, in the way he um, approaches things and, and um, you know, doles out playing time, people earn it, that type of thing. Um, also, you know, that guardrail, I feel like uh, James Johnson on one side and, and Pascal, to see him, you know, he has been through the elite success in the league and um, seeing how it can flip quickly and uh, the way he has approached the team this summer and, and you know, the eloquent use of the F-bomb um, in his, <laughs> his, his uh, talks with the team. You know, he's not joking around. He, he understands and, and knows, um, uh, wants to make sure everybody's aware of, of what they're going into now. The expectations are raised. Last year at this time, expectations were like, yeah, I hope. You know, I was worried last year they were going to waste a year of Tyrese um, Halliburton. I mean, it's like, yeah, they signed a big extension. You could excel and say, okay, we have them, you know, for five years. Um We'll, we'll get to it. But fortunately, they didn't. You know, they came out of the gate so well. They made the deal for Pascal. And now it's like, you know, now they're, they're still trying to develop guys, but but they're, uh, they're not, you know, they're aiming at the big prize as well. So they should. And I think Pascal's message, is, he's the perfect guy to say it because he won a championship and then didn't reach the yeah. conference finals till last year, right? Like, that that certainly resonates with guys, and they relied on Bruce Brown for a lot of that stuff last year. Now they have a different guy to kind of have that voice and those experiences to pass on, although they've all been there themselves, so it is right. a little different. When you think back to the, the 13 and 14 seasons going to the conference finals, obviously trades midseason played a factor in all that, and there's a lot of differences. But I what what do you remember about – how much expectations really changed the way those teams were perceived too, because they were good in 11, 12, right? They won around, yeah. but the, no, like that, that reaching the conference finals the first time was so relieving and exciting for a lot of that team. But then when the expectations came the following year, even though they made it again, it felt so much different. Right. And so I don't think anyone expects the Pacers to get to the conference finals in this coming season, whereas that team certainly was expected to do well. But expectations are on this team now in a way they haven't been before. And that certainly changes the way a team is perceived, I think, both inside and out. Yeah, I mean, th those teams, um, as a, you know, especially that that second run to the, the conference finals, was, um, and then we had the trades, and and it's, God, it's been 
funny, kind of fun that, you know, one of the benefits of these player podcasts is hearing some of the stuff that was really going on, um, not only with the Steven Jackson crew, but even, you know, I heard Evan Turner um, um, talking about, you know, stuff and, and you, you heard rumors and, of things and, and um, the, the chemistry is one thing, but when, you know, there was a little lull there with that team. And I think Bird was like trying to push some buttons, get an edge with that, them, get it back. You know, Roy Hibbert was kind of fading a little bit and then he really faded. <laughs> you know, every the, the deal I, I will always, um, I, I, I like the deals they did, but it's, it wasn't, um, it, it kind of exposed the team as, as not being as, as mentally tough or championship tough as they needed to be, um, which was the hope that they would fortify what they had, but instead it kind of, kind of cracked it and, and, and then it didn't work out. And then all of a sudden, you know, verticality is no longer and the whole, you know, the whole style of the team has changed. And that's the thing with this year's group is that, you know, there have been a lot of changes with some of the upper teams. Um, and if you look on paper, the Pacers look like um, they don't match up. But, but the style and the way they play, they have a lot of the right pieces. Um, and, you know, some of that now is, is will some of the, there's so many young guys with the young guys who weren't right in the mix all the time, you know, the Matherin, the, the Jarris, those type of guys. Are they going to be able to keep developing and work their way into that? Or are they going to be guys that can fit in this style of play long term? Um, I think Benedict Matherin can fit in a di- bunch of different styles of play and be valuable. So, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, show me this year and in camp and then, you know, when they get the minutes and being able to um, to manage that and, and try and see all the value. And then, you know, if things aren't going as well as they did last year, as well as they hope, you know, then, then you can think about consulting some of these guys because there's so many guys that are going to be battling for minutes. Um, one guy, Ben Shepard, I feel like it's just assumed he's going to be like the 12th guy or 11th guy sometimes. And I wouldn't be happy if I were him after all he did last year. Be like, hey, I want to get my my chance to get my minutes in there because I know I can be valuable on the court. Um, and, and all those guys have different personalities, they're at different stages and with their contracts. And those are all the variables that, that make it, you know, dicey when you're bringing back the whole crew again uh, to to go on this marathon, or really, it's like a triathlon. <laughs> it's a shame we never coined horizontality after verticality. <laughs> it was right. so much that year. Yeah, all that's exactly right, and a big factor in why they have to not reset, but just be cognizant of all that this yeah. year. But they have the right, I think, leadership to do it. And you mentioned their <laughs> respect for Carlisle; that's certainly a factor. Hey, everyone, short little break here. We got to talk about the great people over at FanDuel. FanDuel is the perfect spot for NFL fans and everyone else alike because you can start the ongoing season with a big return on FanDuel. They are America's number one sports book. So if you get that hunch in the middle of the game, it's happened to everybody before, you can check out the latest stats. You can view live play-by-play and so much more right on the FanDuel app in the same page where you place your bets. How about that for convenience and a way to see everything all at once? You'll get started, too, with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. All you got to do is place a $5 bet, $200 in bonus bets. It's all right there in the same place, and that is on FanDuel.com. Tom, I want to talk about some other stuff that could be obstacles this year. Can I throw numbers at you? Numbers. That's all right, true. let's do numbers. Let's start by talking about the 2023, excuse me, 2022-23 Sacramento Kings. I've hinted at this point on this podcast before, but I really want to dive into why. The 2022-23 Sacramento Kings had a 118.6 offensive rating. That was first in the NBA by a mile. 1.3 points per 100 possessions better than anybody else. Their defense was pretty good. They won 48 games. They were the third seed in the West. Look at this very fun, cool, ascending team with this unique, very hard-to-guard offensive style. 
the Kings last year, the season that just happened right after it, did not have as good of an offense. Their offensive rating was actually worse last year than it was two years ago at 116.2. They defended better. They still won 46. They were good. But that elite offense and that style went away despite having very similar personnel. I don't think this would happen to the Pacers because Tyrese Halliburton is an incredible player. But is it even is it possible to you that the Pacers could not be one of the best two, three offenses this year and could fall to like the 10 range? It does not seem possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> it doesn't and, to me either, but it, but it just happened, right? Like, yeah, I know, like, I know. And, and and again, I go back to like the the um, style of the team, and you know the the players who are more valuable to the Pacers than they would be on other teams playing a different style. Um, it seems like the Pacers have an excess of those type of players, you know. With with me, Smith, with Ben Shepard, with with Matherin, and and they can get out and run and top and and, and all that. So if they do go down the, to you know lose any of that, I don't know top three offensive standing in the league, it is going to be a rough year because um, you know their defense, uh, you know that off that offensive pace and all that is always going to have their defensive numbers be a little lower, regardless. But um, they have to be able to improve a little bit on the defense, and it, but it can't take that much away from the offense because right. um, I think, you know, that, that Boston series was a great example of just, you know, and when they can, you know, playing the full court pressure, pushing the pace, they were just hard to play. And, you know, you heard Joe Mazzula, you heard Derek White um, both comment on, yeah, it's just hard to play the Pacers. And that, that has to be um, the way, that, you know, that has to translate also into the into the um, regular season. A lot, a lot of years the Pacers have been a team that has played harder in the regular season than other teams. Uh, but now they have to just be a team that, with that pace, with that effort, they're forcing the opponent to play. It's got to be one of those things where they're like, oh, God, we got to go play the Pacers. <laughs> you know, I got to got to get my rest or whatever, you know? So, yeah. so, um, and, and to maintain that, I just can't see it. that offense taking that big a dip with everybody, you know, so many young guys still and Pascal having a lot more, um, time to, um, adjust and, and be, um, even more of a focal point now, um, and miles in a contract here. I mean, <laughs> I can't see it. I just can't see it. That would be a big bummer. Let's just <laughs> Massive, put it that right? way. Right. Right. So they, the Kings buoyed this. They were 12th in pace uh, two years ago, by the way. Pacers obviously much faster last year and second. Um, the, the thing that changed for the Kings is they went from 24th in defense to 14th, which offset some of that, that tumble. And then, but no one like bought them. And then they'd even make the playoffs, right? Like it just felt different. Mm -hmm. So the difference is there. I'm not saying I think this is going to happen. I'm just saying that I would like to to throw this into the ring as like a could this go wrong kind of deal because it just happened to the Kings. Is no one of the Kings <laughs> is close to as good of an offensive talent as Halliburton. Maybe, maybe not close as a stretch, but like Tyrese Halliburton's just better. The Siakam addition you mentioned certainly helps. What something strange happened though with the Kings were like Kevin Herter just became a, like a lemon last year out of nowhere, <laughs> right? Like, and he was really valuable to their offense. And then they had, they had a lot of injuries last year. They were super healthy two years ago. And trust me, we're going to talk about healthier in a second. Yeah. So that all changed too. like one player, two players really changed their fortunes, but it is really uh, odd and interesting to me that a team that had this faster, not rapid, but faster pace and had this elite offense just completely fell off that last year. And it didn't go the same way, even though people thought it would, including me, but, such as life in the NBA, Kings were sort of still sort of healthy last year. I think the Kevin Herter drop off uh, certainly hurt them, and they'll try to get back to it. But I, I think this is exceedingly unlikely to happen to the Pacers. I just would like to say that the team that uh, was breaking the league with crazy pace on offense two years ago was not as good last year, and now the Pacers are kind of in that group. The other difference, though, is one you already mentioned. Their style did translate to the playoffs. They won two rounds, and the Celtics were like, hey, that was the best team we played which maybe that makes you think more like the Timberwolves of two years ago who mm -hmm. lost in the first round. The Nuggets were like, hey, that was the best team we played. And then, then they were Timberwolves were even better the next year. So 
Uh, maybe it's a stupid comparison, but I just – I'm throwing the hat in the ring. I'm, I'm ruffling feathers today. It's a possibility. <laughs> no fun. No, no fun possibility. All right. The other thing that I would like to talk about, which is totally random and not in the Pacers' control at all and has anything to do with how they play, it's health. The least fun thing mm-hmm. to talk about in the league. Look, I, I think people would say that Halliburton missed whatever 17 to however many games you want to say because he was – uh, playing 20 minutes a game in that stretch in February. So those count as games played, but they weren't like meaningful. Right. The Pacers finished 24th. So flip that sixth uh, in, in health last year, like in a positive way. And they have a good medical staff, but they, that that's based off. I use B-ball indexes injury data because what they do is they base injury absences off of the impact lost. So like, even though the Sixers didn't have as many games lost other teams losing MB for so much meant that they were the second most impacted team by injuries last year. The Pacers, we're seventh to last, right? And so they were pretty healthy last year, which is good. But, you know, Obi Toppin played all 82, Turner 77, Neesmith 72, McConnell 71, Nemhard 68, Hal Burton 69, although not really, right? And then Smith and Jackson's numbers aren't accurate because they were not unhealthy. They were just stealing games from each other. And Pascal Siakam played every game after the trades. So that's almost 10 guys that were, like, pretty dang healthy throughout the season. Yeah. Again, Hal Burton missed time. Matherin missed a lot of time, which which matters. But in general, they were pretty healthy last year, and may, maybe they can be again. Maybe they just have a group of pretty healthy guys on the team. But health can just be pretty random in the NBA. And so if they get closer to average or even below average in this stat, how much does that change what things look like? Can they offset that with general improvement from their young guys? You know, that's one that I am fascinated by. Yeah, and that's always the uh, – um great fear with, with any team is, is how many games miss like with Halbert, obviously not only does, um, does he need to play, but he needs to be healthy, <laughs> you know, like a hundred percent healthy to be at his, at his peak and, and have the team running at his peak. Um, and, you know, I think that is, you know, potentially, you know, the, the negative side effect of, of trying to play that hard, um, with with that much pace, um, is it could could lead to injury, and that is why it's so valuable to be able to sign a TJ McConnell, um, and hope that you at least have two of those three guys or keep things running um, and normal um, if if someone does have to go out. But um, you know, Halliburton's health is is essential for any of the hopes of this team. You know. Rising up, and, and you know, I feel like yes, they made that run to the Eastern Conference Finals, but it was like that Eastern Conference was so tight last year, and, and they got in the playoffs, and it, it'd just be you know nice to stay in that mix with some of those teams that are considered elite the whole way, and and not have you know some of the lulls they had against some of the lesser teams, um, so they can you know maybe handle a two week period of injury. And, and again, like you say, see those younger guys get those opportunities and they should be better equipped to to contribute. Um, but that would put a lot of pressure on some of those young guys to to step up. Um, and, and that, uh, you know, I mean, also the big guys. I mean, it's big guys get hurt. <laughs> you know, and Miles Turner, knock on whatever, you know, his health. And obviously he's going to be motivated to play as much as he can this year. Um, but you know, they're obviously getting thin there, um, up front and would, would really struggle if uh, there were other injuries up, up front. One more break here, y'all, so we can talk about the lovely folks over at Prize Picks America's number one daily fantasy sports app. They have over five million active members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections. Watch your winnings roll in. It's the best way to get on the action in most states, including California, Texas, and Georgia. You can play alongside your favorite celebrities. It's the only real money daily fantasy platform with an injury insurance policy. So your lineup stay in play, even if one of your players gets hurt. More than or less than on player stat projections, as easy as it gets. Download the Prize Picks app today. Use the code Locked On NBA. You'll get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. That's code Locked On NBA on Prize Picks to get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. You don't even need to win to receive the fifty dollars bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize Picks run your game. 
yeah, 77 games for Turner last year is probably the most impressive one to me of of all of them. Maybe top on all 82 is extremely impressive. But Turner, big guys missed time. I'm not going to kill him for playing in the 60s or low 70s throughout his career. But 77 yeah. is immense. If he can do that again, that's huge, right? Jackham did not miss a game with yeah. the Pacers, right? Do I expect him to play all 82? Probably not, right? So where does this actually shake out? Depending on what stat you want to use, you can take this a lot of different directions to shape your narrative. In minutes missed, they were 10th. So that's like close to average. In actual impact missed, though, they were a little lower on the scale uh, just because of how it shook out. So mm-hmm. that that is certainly a, an interesting fact to me last year. Something that really like – it was such a small number of games that it doesn't get talked about a lot. They went 7-6 and six without Halliburton last year, which was massive in them staying in the race and getting to sixth because they were so awful without him last year. They, they were minus 50 outscored in those 13 games. So certainly a little bit of luck factor to escape seven and six. (laughs) Like they're still clearly not very good in those games, but the fact that they were able to win those was huge. So they're better without it, but they're still not like their style. Just he is it a lot in a lot of ways. So his health is specifically the most important, but in general, I, I would like, it's more likely than not, they have more injuries than last year. Right. So that's, that's certainly something that could be interesting to monitor this year. Do you have anything that you thought of when you think what, what could go sideways for this Pacers team this year that, that pops to mind? Well, you know, the, the, the human element is always uh, an issue. <laughs> and guys have been paid. Um, and then there's guys that want to get paid, want to develop. I, you know, you think about Jairus Walker and Matherin in particular as lottery pick guys. And um, they want to they want to prove that, that they're – going to be that level of NBA player and have that opportunity. And, you know, likely it'll take some time to get in there. It's kind of funny thinking back to last year when, you know, with the Bruce Brown and, and the Buddy Hill and, and all these guys who played at certain points, Jalen Smith. And, and it seems like they're going to get opportunities at some point, no matter what. It's just, that's just the natural evolution of an NBA season. Um, but um, the, the key to that good chemistry and keeping them engaged and, and ready to go, I mean, because you never know when that opportunity is going to come, um, they have to be, you know, ready to go. And if not, then that is going to, you know, that, that's how you get a little chink in the armor of, of the good chemistry when when uh, guys show up and, and they aren't ready to go. And, and those – I'm not concerned about the guys you got paid, like kind of relaxing. I, I don't think any of those guys are, are you know, that's an issue. Um, I'm, I'm more concerned with, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's like a, a game of musical chairs. There's, there's only, you know, 10 chairs maybe. And, and there's 12 guys who would like to, to get in there and, and, and have their opportunity and, and ha- going through another year of, of having to be patient for some of those guys could, could just get frustrating. And, and, but that's where those vets, I think with, with Siakam and, and Johnson and then again, again, Carlisle being straight and, and keeping guys engaged and keeping guys ready and um, will be critical. Um, and hopefully it doesn't uh, create any issues otherwise. Yeah. It's like Turner contract year, Ben Matherin going into his rookie extension year, Right, that all certainly matters yeah, to them. And, exactly. Um, you know, the, the thing about the way the NBA is right now, where teams navigate over the cap so much more than they used to, and free agency is less of a thing. Like players are always kind of on the clock for extensions, right? If yeah. you just signed a deal, I suppose it could seep into your brain to be lazy for like one season, if that <laughs> human element even exists. But like that is not that's less of a thing now, just because of the way it's not not a thing, but it's less of a thing yeah. with the way player movement goes. So I suppose that could be a factor. They just signed a lot of guys. But, yeah, that the future deals coming up certainly matters. Guys always know about it or are informed about it or whatever. So I do wonder, though, what that is. Like we heard from Carlisle about his conversations with, to name two guys from last year that you didn't mention, Jordan War and Daniel Tice about right. what their roles were going to be heading into the season. Like they added Obi Toppin and Jarris Walker last year. After Wara played pretty well, he was out of the rotation in a contract year. He's overseas now. Like Tice was the fourth center. He was on an expiring deal. He wasn't playing, right? They He got a buyout and got somewhere where he was playing, and it worked out. He's, he might start for a team this year, which is 
completely <laughs> insane for other reasons, but you know, like that stuff matters. And so how, how it all shakes out with this team, which this year specifically, it might not come to a head as much um, depending on what happens with miles, but you know, they said the right things already, uh, but, but it's always a factor, right? It's part of the NBA. It's part of the business. That's why every time, I love this is my new one of my new favorite NBA things. Every time you ask a player or GM or coach about business contract stuff, they, I love it here or that guy loves it here. We love that guy. And then comma, but it's a business, right? Like yeah. it's, it's always coming and it's a necessary hedge because it's just a huge part of it when the money part gets in. It just changes things. So, yeah, the human element is a factor for sure. Yeah. So it's like, well, it's not totally up to me. So I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's never up to anyone. Yeah. yeah. That's true. <laughs> so I'm not sure what that will look like. Uh, and that kind of is related to chemistry, uh, but it is a little different yeah. because that yeah. part, that, like if Ben Matherin gets traded, like that still matters to him somewhere else. So that's yeah. not, that, that still is a huge deal for the Pacers, obviously, specifically, but it's different from chemistry in that way and that the business part transfers around. Uh, and this this is the the last generic concern I guess people could have about the Pacers. Look, if they don't guard that much better, like they're still going to be battling yeah. to get out yeah. of the lane. Right? Like, like if they're still bottom six, seven, eight in defense, it, that's just so low that it's hard to win. The people keep talking about, and I don't think it's crazy, but people keep saying, oh, "I think this team can win fifty games." Like, yeah, I see that path. I'm not going to say anyone's dumb for saying that, but if they guard like they did last year, they will not win fifty games, right? So they right. they have to defend better if they want to avoid that five, six, seven, eight tier that people keep putting them in that they don't want to be in. And the East is good. That's hard to do. They were better on defense after the all-star break last year, but they've got to make, they have to maintain that or else it could just be hard for them to actually create a bunch of standing separation. But that doesn't feel like anything that people aren't talking about. That's kind of more of what I wanted to focus on today, but it still is obviously a relevant concern for next year. Absolutely. And I mean, not just guarding and, you know, making it difficult, but closing out, that defensive possession and getting the freaking yeah. ball off the glass. I mean, the season ended fittingly um, last year with, with the offensive <laughs> rebounds that that uh, Boston grabbed that was just like, oh, my God, you know. Um, so, yeah, both – all that all that combined, just getting the ball and, you know, obviously they get stops and then they're, they're lethal because they can get going the other way. And, um, I mean, they're, they're pretty strong getting the ball out of the bucket – and getting it going the other way, but when they can get a stop, um, that's when we get the old East Bay fuck dunks and and uh, really have the fun going the other way. So when I felt like I could tell the Pacers were playing well or clicking last year's when they were like sprinting out of bounds to get the ball to get in transition more often, and hey, you know how they get in transition more often? Stopping the other team. <laughs> and I don't, exactly. I don't want to read into the stretch too much, but you nailed the other part of it of rebounding because. They yeah. made that starting lineup change the day after Christmas, which sticks with starting, right? That was a very brief stretch before Halburn got hurt when they won six in a row, and it was a nine out of ten. And they looked awesome. They were defending pretty well. This was pre-Siakam. They were defending pretty well. They were still scoring at an elite level. They were getting rebounds. Now, here are their wins in that stretch. Houston, Chicago, New York, the day they traded for Ananobi, so they were like a ghost of a team. Mm -hmm. uh, Milwaukee twice, Atlanta, Washington, Atlanta again. One of the wins was Boston. That's good. The Bucs are good, but the Pacers had no trouble with them. The rest of that is not like an awesome stretch of schedule. They still cleaned up, though, and looked pretty good, And which is – that's 10 games. Like, it's a small sample, but it's kind of proof positive to what you're saying. So, that's the thing. If they get to if – even if they get to 20th, I think they feel secure that they have a chance at top four. But if they can't get to 20th, they're going to – Oh, yeah, have to exactly. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It's like the glimpses give you hope from last year that <laughs> there's something in there, but man, they, they got to bring it all together. <clears throat> they do. Uh, you have anything else, Tom? If not, I will free you of having to talk to me any longer. <laughs> I think it's good. I was a little nervous about you bringing me on to talk about what could go wrong. You know, I mean, that's not. <laughs> uh, the, I feel the, bad. Uh, I, the, uh, hey, do you want to be a wet blanket to, for people Minister for a minute? Is that so fun? Yeah. <laughs> But I have, I have seen a lot of things go bad over the years. So. <laughs> Your question is kind of what inspired me to get going. Because I've like half-baked this idea of an episode in my head. Because like in the offseason, every team is so excited, right? And yeah. I don't want to ignore that. The Pacers have an exciting season coming their way. But I'm always like, 
There's a lot of stuff that I just want to talk about just in case, right? Just like, like hey, remember yeah. when I talked about that with Tom? And then your question was like, oh, that's perfect. Like, that's exactly something I want to bring into the discussion. So you cool. you 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 made yourself the invitee by yeah. <laughs> asking my favorite question of the press conference. Congratulations. All right. well, what inspired that? Did you think of that on the way in or was that like an in the moment kind of deal? Yeah, man, I mean, I just, I, I have kind of written a little bit about it. Um, and it, 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 I mean, it's my favorite aspect of uh, following the NBA is is all the uh, you know the the HR human relations part of it. Um, <laughs> I, I I manage people at work, and it, it, some of the stuff is the same thing. Like someone gets fired, or someone goes down to another position, or gets a raise, and people every everybody acts different a little bit, and you gotta. You got to, you know, take the temperature of everybody and, and make sure everybody's still going in the right direction. And, you know, for an NBA team, it's like times 100. So it's it's fun to see um, how everyone reacts when, when things pop up like that. So You, you don't work at a billion-dollar company? Yeah, not quite. People don't uh, pay money to come watch you do your job, Tom? No, yeah, <laughs> no. I don't have the scrutiny of anybody on Twitter coming after me. So if you ever tell me you have a bad day at work, I will tweet it just so you, know. um, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Well, thank you for the time, Tom, where can people find you and, and your stuff? And by the way, in the, in the era of direct to consumer, Tom's about to tell you where to get it, but a uh, highly recommended subscription for me to Tom Lewis. Go ahead. Yeah. I appreciate it, Tony. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm a substack stack now at indycornrose.com. So same uh, URL I've always had, and also on uh, Twitter at Indy Cornrows. Um, still doing that a little bit, or X, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're starting to fire up things here after after a little break in, in August and early September. So looking forward to the season, and I guess we'll see you on Monday, Tony. A media day? I can't believe it. I can't. I really can't believe it. I can't believe September is almost over. Like, what yeah. happened to 2024? Um, yes, give Tom a follow, read everything he has to say about the team. Been around way longer than me, has much more nuance about past <laughs> pacers than I do. Uh, yeah, Media Day is Monday, so that's the next episode here. What to watch for from Media Day, what I hope to learn myself about this team, and then they're practicing starting Tuesday. So we're off. It is a good pacer season. <laughs> Goodbye, off season. Good riddance. I hate <laughs> everything from like post summer league to the start of the season. Just please just skip that. I don't want that anymore. Put it in the rear. It's over back Monday. Tell then everybody have a wonderful weekend.